Well, we've been uh, in a series of messages on the, from the minor prophets in, uh, in the Old Testament. Um, each one a little bit different and, um, and mostly unread and unknown by most of us. Uh, and I uh, got myself in that. And uh, I've managed to dodge them a lot of my life, except for key verses periodically. Uh, today, though, is uh, uh, Pentecost Sunday, which in the, in the church calendar is the, actually it's the celebration of the birthday of the church, when the, the Holy Spirit was unleashed and uh, followers of Jesus and they went out into the community and caused a big hubbub and everything. And the very first sermon of the, of the church uh, was preached by Peter. And uh, in Acts chapter two, he gets up in front of everybody and kind of, you know, pastors make jokes, you know, at the beginning of their sermons, which is really, never works but he goes you know hey you know all these guys aren't drunk you know it's still nine in the morning uh they'll be drunk later you know and uh that did that went over really well and then uh and then he quoted from the prophet joel uh, in the last days god says i'll pour out my spirit on all people your sons and daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions your old men will dream dreams even on the servants, the men and women servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And I'll show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth below. Uh, and then it goes down to verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that was the beginning of the very first sermon preached in the, in the life of the church. So as we celebrate Pentecost Sunday and we remember that uh, God unleashed his spirit, which we've sung about today, uh, I want us to look at this, uh, this prophet, Joel, that, uh, that Peter used as the foundation for his first sermon. And I want us to look at that today and see what God's saying to us in our situations and how uh, the Holy Spirit of the living God can uh, take over our life and not just uh, be something we think about intellectually, but actually take control of our lives and, uh, and lead us forward. So uh, pray with me. Lord Jesus, teach us from your word. Teach us how we might follow you and, and teach us how we might be open uh, to your spirit. Um, come into us today and release us by your power and draw us with your love. We give you the glory. Amen. Um, so when I, I've always heard this passage uh, from, from the uh, prophet Joel used in the context of uh, Acts and the beginning of the church and all those kind of things. And, I, and I've always thought, this is such a great passage, you know, the spirit of God's going to fall on you and you're all going to prophesy and it's young and old and men and women and free and slave and everybody's included in this. There's no, there's no, nobody's left out. And I always thought that's really great. And so I thought... This must be, this book of Joel must be one of the most positive uh, parts of the whole Bible. It must be part of the, the whole Old Testament. It must be, stands out as something that's just totally positive, right? Because it's about God's Spirit being unleashed. So imagine my surprise when I actually open the Bible. And, and let, let me just tell you how it starts. The Word of the Lord came to Joel. It's actually pronounced Joel in Hebrew. It means uh, God's with us. Um, hear this. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children. Let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. And what the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. And what the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunks, and weep. <laughs> now that's how this starts. And I'm thinking, wow, how did Peter stretch that into a Pentecost sermon? You know, <laughs> wow. But then I started thinking about it. Have you ever noticed that when uh, difficult things happen in our life, it usually doesn't just stand alone, but uh, 
one bad thing happens and then it's like you're, you're reeling from that and then you get punched with another one and then something else happens and then you get punched on the other side and, and pretty soon you're going, whoa, how much can I take? You ever, am I the only one who feels this way? <laughs> am I alone here in this? <laughs> I'll say amen to myself. Okay, so um, in, in business they call this the, the cascade effect. And there's books written about you can go to Barnes and Noble and pay huge amounts of money for these books, but I'll save you the money and just tell you. The cascade effect starts with a, a, an event and a decision's made about regarding that event and then things decline and so we've got to fix the decline so you do another decision and then boom, something else. And, pretty, and we're talking Niagara Falls, baby. It's like boom, 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 boom. We see this all the time. And uh, we see it in churches. I, I've been in church, I've, and I've worked with people who've been in churches and have friends who've been in churches that are living out the cascade effect. I used to call it a death spiral. <laughs> but I was told that was negative. So, you know, my new positive way, it's a cascade effect. And the cascade down is never positive, right? And I think that that's what God's saying to us. Uh, there evidently was a huge uh, locust plague, locust swarm, that devoured the, the, the land. And, uh, but, but the thing is, you know, what one locust forgot, another one came along and got. And then what they left behind, some other locust got. And boom, 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 boom. And I thought, that's what it's like in our life. You know, we could take one thing, any of us could. We'd come in here, we'd share it, we'd pray for each other, we'd get past it. Wouldn't that be great? But we don't have one thing. We've got a cascade. And when that happens, uh, I'll tell you, because I've, I've, I've cascaded enough times in my own personal life, you know, in my relationships. So when this happens, my first instinct is to try and fix it because I'm pretty good at fixing stuff. Right? Not like changing light bulbs, that kind of stuff, but, but other things. I, I can solve a lot of problems, and I can fix a lot of things in your life if you'd let me. And just, it's my own that I struggle with. But uh, the thing is, when you're in a cascade, we get to a point where we realize there is absolutely nothing we can do to stop this. There is nothing we can do to change this. There's no brilliant plan that we're going to come up with that's going to stop the cascade. So what hope is there? I could say, well, there's no hope. Let's close in prayer and then <laughs> go get lunch. But that's, that wouldn't be fair. Because what Joel uh, tells us is, when we find ourselves layer after layer of locust plague eating away at our life and we have nowhere to turn we turn to the Lord that's what you do you return to the Lord and, and remember uh, last week's uh, message we talked about uh, God says return to me and I will return to you we'll meet if you would just stop and turn to me and so uh, the message in Joel, as it goes along, is you're in the middle of all this. Everything's horrible. Uh, in fact, it talks about even the cattle are making noise. They're so bummed because, and then, and then it says not just the cattle. You know the sheep that'll eat anything? They just kind of go along and nibble at, at nothing, you know? They're bummed. That's how bad it's gotten. Even the sheep are bummed. And then um, it talks about... a. Verse 13, um, tear your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave a blessing for you. Who knows? You don't have anything else to lose when you're in a cascade. So why not turn to the Lord? Who knows? Maybe he'll leave you a blessing 
and, and turn it around. And, uh, and then we get this amazing um, promise in uh, verse 25 of chapter 2. And uh, I, I love this promise from God. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Isn't that a cool verse? I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locusts and the young locusts and the other locusts and the locust swarm. All of them. The layers of the cascade. I'm going to, to repay you for all the losses of that one loss after loss after loss after loss. Verse 26, you'll have plenty to eat until you're full and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. And never again will my people be shamed. They'll know that I am in Israel and that I am the Lord your God and that there is no other. And never again will my people be shamed. That's the context. I'm going to repay all that you've lost in this swarm of locusts. And you will be my people, and you will not be put to shame. And then we get to this passage, this promise that Peter takes on that very first sermon in the life of the new church. And after that, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, the young men will see visions. Even the servants, men and women servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and I'll show wonders. That takes on so much more meaning for me when you see the context of a people who have lost everything. Everything they hold dear is gone, and they, the ability to solve their own problems is way gone. And we find ourselves in a situation like that, and, and when we turn to the Lord, we get this, this great promise of God not just showing up, but showing up with power and grace and generosity and healing and restoration. <laughs> and lifting the shame. Because I'll tell you, and I, and I know this, and I know you know this, when we go through the cascade, we can't help but feel shame. Oh, I know, probably, if I was a different person, if I was a better person, then it wouldn't be like this, and da, da, da. You know, everybody does that when they go through something. That's the first thought. And we don't need pastors like me reminding you, well, you know, you could have done something better. You know, that, that was really effective, you know. <laughs> so just smack me upside the head if I do that to you. You chose poorly. <laughs> <laughs> so what? <laughs> the shame will be lifted. The sense of, well, maybe I did it wrong. Maybe this wouldn't have happened if I would have done something else or said something else or been somebody else or whatever. God said, I'm, I'm taking that shame away. I'm restoring you. I'm giving you back the years that the locusts say, and I'm taking away the shame that holds you, that holds you down. And then this promise of the, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Uh, in the Old Testament spirit, the, the it's the ruach, which means the, the breath of God. The breath of God. I'm going to pour out my breath. We sang that, right? We sang, uh, you know, your spirit, your breath in my lungs. And, uh, and that's a very, very Hebrew picture. The ruach, the, the breath of God, bringing life and healing and restoration and wholeness and all of those things that, that God's spirit brings into our life. He says, I'm going to pour out my breath on you and, and what will happen? You'll, you'll dream dreams. You'll have visions. You'll, you'll, you'll speak out my word. You'll prophesy young and old and men and women and slave and free. And, uh, everybody is going to, with my spirit in them, is going to speak out God's word in their situation. We'll all be prophets. That is so, so powerful. But what's it mean for us to get a vision? I think it's the, the stepping back a little bit from our cascade, from our shame, which 
which colors everything. You know, it's like wearing those those uh, ski glasses. You ever anybody ever ski or know someone who once did <laughs> or read a magazine once? Okay, so they have these glasses. That, I don't know if you know them, but, but you can get ski. I once a year. I I used to. It's been a few years, but I used to go one day a year skiing with a group of guys who were, all would go down those black diamond trails, you know, straight down to their death, and, uh, and I would be king of the bunny slopes. <laughs> Rope toes, you know, I'm doing great. <laughs> and, and, and once we went up to Tahoe with, with my small group men, and one of the guys in it was, uh, was older and had a really bad Parkinson's. He said, you know, I'm tired all the time because my arm keeps twitching. You know, it's like I'm working out all day long. And, uh, and he was a, had been a brilliant skier, had a cabin up in Tahoe. We were staying there. And uh, after a while, he said, you know, I'm too weak to keep up with these guys on the Black Diamonds anymore. Why don't I ski with you, John? <laughs> I'll encourage you. I'll help you. And uh, so Ray, Ray Yance, uh, would do that. We'd stand at the top of this little slope, you know, and he'd go, boom, and then stop, and then wait. Well, I do. Two turns and, and a fall. And then get up, and then two turns and a fall. I create a snow plow. Oh, and he kept going, you know, it's a lot less work if you just go downhill. <laughs> you keep going back and forth and back and forth and falling and getting up and back and forth. I go, well, it's scary if you go downhill. But he would wait and he, he said, this is the perfect ski day for me because I can ski for about 30 seconds and then rest for about 20 minutes while you get there. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can take off again and then I rest and wait for you as you come down the mountain, down the mountain. So, you know, I had a ski partner, you know, yeah, that's what I got. So, anyway, but the thing is, when they have these goggles that you can get, I read it mine, but, but uh, they have colors in them, which is really weird, because usually, you know, like, you guys are cool, you wear those shades, you know, the dark glasses, which, by the way, Seattle has the highest per capita sales of glasses, of sunglasses in the nation. And the reason is because it's like this all the time, gray and cloudy, and we don't need them, and then the sun comes out, one day and we run out and buy a pair of sunglasses and then we wear them that day and then it's like this again for a month or so and then and then the sun comes out again and we can't find them so we run out and buy them again you know when we do that all through the year so we, we use a lot of sunglasses and they're usually dark and they and they shade things you know and all those things skiers have just the opposite i they they gave me some glasses that had like orange yellow how cool was that you know, and I'm kind of a depressive guy. I'm negative. I go through life kind of, you know, shady. <laughs> oh, it's all I wore those and I felt like Norman Vincent Peale. <laughs> Power of positive thinking. You know, I mean, I, I have my glasses on. I'm looking out there. It's like the world is bright. Oh, it's so good. I thought I should wear these when I preach. <laughs> There's just, you know, everything's clear and it's right there. And you can just go for it. But it's really just an illusion. But it did help. Now the thing is, when you get a vision, and, and, we're, and it's not colored by, by our events or situations or a pain or a shame or any of those things, and we, and we, and we get, God actually gives us a vision of what could be beyond what is. And that's a miracle. Because when we are in our stuff, we lose track of what could be. All we see is this, and it'll never change. Nothing will make a difference. And God said, no, I want to give you a vision. I want to give the vision to the young and to the old, to the men and women. And for, you know, I want everybody to have a new vision of what can be. And I tell you, I, I don't think this is for, for old times. I don't think this is a historical thing. I think this is what he wants to do in you and in me and in all of us today. To help us see what could be as his ruach, his breath, his spirit is poured out in his people. And how it changes us. And I, I was thinking about this because sometimes when God begins to work and renewal starts to happen in our life, personally or uh, as a church, uh, things like that, uh, we don't recognize it. 
Have you ever noticed that? When God starts to do something, I'm usually against it. <laughs> you know, I oppose every good idea initially, and then it was my idea if it succeeds. It was Kay's idea if it doesn't. You know, it's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the, the way it works. Uh, and, and so uh, what I, I was thinking is, I had this friend, uh, Bill Pinnell, who i um, uh, known for years and years and years. He grew up in, uh, he was born and grew up in Detroit, Michigan, uh, African-American man. And it's funny, we were, we were having coffee one day, and he said, uh, you know, John, I'm a black man, but I have been white a lot longer than you've been black. <laughs> I had to think about that. <laughs> He said, you know, I realized early on if I was going to get anywhere, I had to start being white, so I did. And my wife was furious at me for that. Felt like I've, I've really lost something along the way. But he said, you know, I've been white for a long time. But, but anyway, I would invite him to come in and, uh, and sometimes guest speak at, at preaching classes that I was having at Fuller Seminary. And he'd come in to talk to us about preaching from African-American perspective and culture. And one day we were talking, and he was... Uh, we were talking about this whole thing of how do we see what God's doing? And um, I made notes after that conversation because it was so good. Here's what he said. Picture a little congregation of faithful believers down in Jackson, Mississippi, around just before the Roaring Twenties hit, 1918, 1919, 1920, around in there. They're gathering at their Wednesday night prayer meeting. He said that's because they all went to that. Everybody went to the Wednesday night prayer meeting. Like they always do. And they're praying, Lord, bring renewal. Bring renewal to our land. Bring renewal to our country. Bring renewal to our hearts. Bring healing. Set us free to be your people. Do a new thing. You know, just what we're talking about with them when the Holy Spirit's released. And meanwhile, he said, a little church in Atlanta, Georgia is gathering. And they're praying, Lord, bring renewal. Pour out your spirit in a new way. Do something, Lord. And then he said this, they didn't even know that while they were praying, a young couple was bending over the cradle of their little baby that they just named um, William Franklin Graham. In, um, okay, you know, Billy. And, uh, and he came to bring renewal, not just to the people in North Carolina and Mississippi and Atlanta, but, but all over the world. And he said, and then just a few weeks later, after their prayer, another set of parents were bent over their little baby that they'd named Martin Luther King, Jr., who the dad always called Michael his whole life. Always called Michael. And they never knew that their little baby would be this agent for healing change and challenge and, and prophecy. And then he said, if you really want to get crazy about this, John, which you do, um, a few weeks later, another couple was holding their baby that they named Rosa. Just a few weeks apart. Down in the south where folks were praying and knowing, so the Lord, pour out your spirit, do something. And no idea what God's doing. Absolutely no idea. And God's at work in, in little ways that we just think is so insignificant and that doesn't really matter. And what good would that do? And how is that going to change anything? And with the ruach, the breath of God, renewal happens. And revival happens. And change happens. And life comes. And it's powerful. If only we could see it. And that's why when the Spirit is poured out on people, we get a vision. We get a dream of what can happen. Right? Because without that, we're not going to see it. God's doing miracles all around us. And we're going, I don't see anything. I'm just on a cascade. You know, just like John, the pastor. You know. Well, look up. So, what do we do? What do we do when the God's Spirit, when His breath comes pouring over us? Got a homework assignment for you. Okay, here's your homework assignment, should you choose to accept it. I will self-destruct in 10 seconds. So, uh, okay, here's what I want you to do. 
I want you to go home today, and I want you to get out a piece of paper, and I want you to make a list of 10 people. They can be close to you, they can be not so close to you, they can be people you know really well, they can be people that are almost strangers to you. I want you to make a list of 10 people. And then, I want you to take some time and just pray through your list for a while. Just pray through your list, because we don't know what people need, we don't know what God wants to do in them, and so we need to ask, we need to take some time to, to pray over this list and say, Lord, to bless them, Lord, you, you want to bless them, you want to love them, you, you want them to know that they're loved, you want them to, to be alive in you. What does that look like? And after we prayed for a while, for the people on the list, I want you to find a way to help them know they're loved. If they've gone through some hard thing and they're living in the shame, maybe you need to invite them to lunch or invite them over for dinner because when people are in shame, they feel like you know, they're, they're so isolated and no one wants to be around them and they have no value anymore. And, and just a simple invitation helps them feel like, I'm still a person, I, I, I can be known, I still have value, and, and you can start to get to, to love them and care for them. It could be sending a card, it could be uh, a phone call, it could be a surprise a gift, it could be anything, but find a way to let them know they're loved. Now, stop at 10. I don't want you to change on the whole community. I just want you to change 10 people's lives, okay? So make your list of 10, pray about them, and then act with those 10. I don't want you, to, if there's an 11th person, I don't want you doing anything for them. It's just, you know, I got rules here. You know, you do the 10. The God will have to deal with you if you go beyond that, you know. <laughs> and he will. <laughs> but I, I, I really want us to do this this week. And, and begin to bless the folks around us because um, we don't know what God's Spirit through us will produce. We don't know what healing is needed without God's Spirit alivening us. Right? So we ask Him to be part of this. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, come Holy Spirit. Blow through our lives, our minds, our relationships, our work, our fears, our hopes. And Lord, give us the, the dreams and the vision of what might happen with you. Help us to, to look at the people around us differently. Through your eyes, through the eyes of love. And Lord, we owe it all to you. So we remain your grateful people. Amen.